All right. How y'all doing today? Welcome to week 24 of Life Imitating Movies, a little podcast my buddy Mitch over there and I started during the pandemic to uh, talk about movies and news stories and stories that resemble movies and movies that resemble stories. So how's your week been going, Mitch? Having a good week. Hope you are as well. Hopefully, hopefully we have a good episode this week talking about some new and interesting movies, some lighter news stories from the past week is kind of our signature thing, not diving super heavy into big, broad, heavy political topics. So I'm looking forward to it. Let's get into the episode here. Let's get into it. So my opening question this week, I either had a really dumb question to ask or I was I figured I'd go cerebral with it. And the mo- the question I had was, is there a movie that you've seen where you've watched it and you're like, all right, this movie is mimicking my life or it's like has aspects of your life where you're like, have they been watching me? So when I thought about this question, I thought, is there a movie out there that just kind of follows around just kind of an average guy? Because that a lot of people just think of themselves as just regular average people. And I couldn't really come up with a good answer for that. So instead, I kind of thought about key events in my life and what movies resemble those. So with that in mind, I picked the super sunshiny and happy marriage story because a key event in my life was my parents' divorce when I was a kid. And it's kind of shaped a lot after that and still does because I still kind of do separate visits and they're like two different worlds. So marriage story kind of reminded me of my parents' divorce and taking some of those things from that. And it definitely mirrored what I was going through in real life sometimes. I guess it's not a bad movie to have because I think in marriage story weren't like they hated each other but their love for their kid was like the paramount thing of the whole movie, right? It was like keeping it separate from their child. Yeah. But you know, I will say when it reminded me, it wasn't like the relationship was as good at the end of that movie with them as it was with my parents and still isn't. But you know, again, it just kind of reminded me a little bit. Right on. That's a good movie. I mean, well, yeah, Laura Dern won her Oscar for that. So it was a pretty solid movie. I, I enjoy good performances all around. So obviously you picked something hopefully not the same that kind of reminded you of your life. So there is one movie out there that I see. I, this was a weird way for me to phrase this question because my movie is the Truman Show because the Truman Show has messed me up hardcore in that I always, I'm always like, am I on the Truman Show right now? I always feel like I'm being watched. And like, so when I was in middle school, I got sent to the principal's office quite often. And uh, one time I went to the principal's office and there was a parent with her two, I don't know, seven, eight, nine, 10 year old daughters there. And I, I swear to this story, I swear it is true. I don't believe I'm over exaggerating at all. They looked at me. And they said, oh, my God, it's him. It's him. It's him. And then that's all I remember of the story. So I believe my life is the Truman Show. And I believe that you're lying to me right now. I think a lot of people could say that, especially after this last zany year that we've had during the pandemic, where they think this is so ridiculous. This has to be scripted and everything going on, where the things that people have gone through that they might think that they're on a TV show in secret. Yeah, dude, it's messed me up. It's, it's not messed me up. I'm not like I'm not like an actual paranoid person. And I've actually kind of outlined a kind of a script that I want to write about a guy who becomes so paranoid after watching The Truman Show. I have like a like a six page outline of that kind of script I want to write. So, you know, it's 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 a good movie, though. It's one of my favorite top 10 movies for me. In that same vein, I think another movie you could have picked with this same theme would have been The Matrix. You're jacked in right now to The Matrix and you don't even know it. Or you could be on a secret TV show while being plugged into The Matrix. So both could apply. I I almost went with uh, the other one that resembles my life, uh, Magic Mike. (laughs) Clearly, clearly. All right. So my first story, a little behind the scenes, is... uh, you know, when we when we go to do these stories, I usually go to Google and I type crazy food stories of the week because there's always something. And this week, Coors Light is introducing a, uh, a a Coors, Coors Light, whatever, is introducing an ice cream. And so I saw that headline and I was like, ew, dude, beer flavored ice cream. I'm not a drinker to begin with, but beer flavored ice cream does not sound good. But when you actually read the article, it's more like a creamsicle 
uh, spritzer type ice cream. I was like, oh, okay, that, that actually doesn't sound too bad. Yeah, my first thought was that too, where I saw Coors Light was coming out with a boozy ice cream, and I thought it was going to be a beer flavored ice cream. And I thought, who actually likes the taste of beer and wants it to be an ice cream that much? But yes, I did read it, and an orange creamsicle, kind of a boozy orange creamsicle flavored ice cream. And who doesn't like that flavor combination? I was on board with it. Unfortunately, it's only seems like it's only available in New York City for the time being, unless you want it shipped to you. But that's probably pretty expensive just for some ice cream. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. You can have a shift here. And then I was wondering too, how much alcohol was in it because I think alcohol doesn't freeze or something like that. And it's only 5% alcohol. So I guess that's not a lot. I don't really know if what's a lot and what's not a lot, to be honest. Well, I'll tell you what, this would probably be a great breakup tool because you could get that duel while you're downing a pint of ice cream. You're also getting drunk if that's enough to do that. So it's kind of a dual purpose thing where I think, and it tastes great. So I'm all for it. (laughs) That'd be a good commercial. You just, the guy sits down next to the girl. He's got his hand behind his back. She she thinks he's about to propose and he just hands her a bowl of boozy ice cream (laughs) instead of proposing. They break up. Oh, I think we just stumbled on a freaking advertising opportunity here, dude. It's not hard to come up with something like that. So this was a little bit tough because, you know, ice cream, there aren't really a lot of movies that this is a movie just about ice cream. You kind of have to pick a scene involving ice cream from a movie, which is what I did. But I'm not sure if that's what you did. I did not. I'm gonna let you go first because now you got me intrigued on your on your pick. What what ice cream based movie do you have? Well, again, it's it's hard to find an ice cream based movie, so I just kind of picked a random scene involving ice cream from a movie, and this is one that my girlfriend has been begging me to introduce into the show—a movie that she's wanted to hear us talk about—and that's the Princess Diaries with Anne Hathaway. Mm-hmm. So a young Anne Hathaway. Because there's a scene in the movie where she has like an ice cream cone that she's enjoying and the popular cheerleader is bullying her and she accidentally drops her ice cream on the cheerleader's uniform and the teachers are saying, oh, no, oops, we didn't see that, you know, because they know she's a mean girl. So that was the scene that I just kind of went with and, you know, just an excuse to talk about this movie as well. Uh, I I hate to be the bearer of bad news and disappoint your girlfriend, but I have never seen The Princess Diaries or its sequel. So I will say, I'll just continue talking. (laughs) (laughs) I will say this was a good example of two movies where the story from one to the other was very coherent, was very A to B. It kind of reminded me maybe a little bit in hindsight of Creed 1 and 2, where you could just watch both back to back and the story is seamless between the two that the story continues it evolves the characters in a logical way it's just a very seamless back to back movie film right on i mean i should watch them i like anne hathaway i love julie andrews and i believe they're directed by uh, gary marshall who i absolutely love so i i probably should check them out one day it's just one of those movies that i never watched never never had a reason to sit down and watch them so I never did. But maybe one day, you know, this 36-year-old man will sit down with a with a bowl of Coors ice cream and watch The Princess Diaries. I think you should, because I'm on a roll here recommending movies that you haven't really seen or seen in a That's while true. with the last few episodes. So add this one to your list, check it off, do whatever you have to do, because I think it's aged pretty well. There are definitely some late 90s, early 2000s things in there, but... I feel like it's aged pretty well. I feel like Anne Hathaway is, of course, likable. Julie Andrews, whenever she's on screen, is a delight. And it's still a pretty enjoyable kind of coming-of-age comedy. So I think it's worth a watch. I will check it out. And my movie is uh, vastly different than your movie. Uh, I just went with a movie that's about – it's kind of about beer because the name of the team is The Beers, and that movie is Basketball. Yeah, man. One of my all-time favorite comedies. Even though Trey Parker and Matt Stone, they talk about how much they hate the movie. I'm like, how can you hate baseball? It's so freaking hilarious. So uh, I see you're wavering. Have you you not a fan? Yeah. So I guess I went with the ice cream part of the story and you went with the beer part of the story, the alcohol part. So 
I will say with basketball, yeah, this is one of the probably one of these where I think it's a little dumb, but you think it's funny that we kind of agree to disagree on. So that's my basic opinion of the movie. I think it's a little stupid. I don't think it's terrible. I don't think it's the worst movie I've ever seen, but when somebody throws it on, I just kind of roll my eyes a little bit and preoccupy myself with something else. Oh man. Yeah. We definitely agree to disagree. Cause I absolutely love that movie. It's directed by Jerry Zucker, you know, who did the airplane movies and did uh, you know, a uh, Kentucky fried movie. If you ever saw that one, it's just, for me, it's a comedy classic. It's up there for me. And, and I think it is, I, I enjoy smart humor, but I also love just dumb humor. And Trey Parker and Matt Stone, for, for, I don't think they make dumb humor. They are some of the smartest working comedians out there, I think. I think you're right. I think at least I'll give them credit for that because I am a Trey Parker and Matt Stone fan, even though I don't necessarily love a lot of their projects in the same way that other people do. I, I, I like South Park. I, I don't love it. But I think they're very underrated that people tend to undermine their comedy all the time by saying it's really stupid that there's no layers or detail to it that it's it's just stupid and pointless but if you really kind of listen and pay attention that they really do craft their comedy really smartly really you know tongue-in-cheek and just very very concise so i will give them credit for that they certainly have a good approach to comedy 100 percent. if need look no further than the two pandemic specials they did uh not long ago those are some of the smartest dumbest most hilarious uh, hours of television I've ever seen. Sure. There's a reason that South Park is still going for so long and is able to spoof everything so well that it takes a look at in real life, mirroring events, kind of like The Simpsons, but obviously a little more adult. But there's a reason it's been on for so long. So Trey Parker and Matt Stone, obviously two people that are a little bit underrated by the general public in terms of comedy. 100%. So not really a news story from this past week, but we did just celebrate Father's Day during the week. And I just wanted to bring this up. I'm not, I wasn't trying to touch a nerve because obviously I know your backstory with your dad, but just people that are able to celebrate. And even if we don't have our dads with us anymore to just reflect fondly on them and do something in their memory or something that they used to like, or in this case with this show, watch a movie that you used to watch together that reminds you of your dad. So is that kind of what you picked with your movie or what you maybe did this past Father's Day? Uh, no, uh, no, this Father's Day, I went to my buddy's house down in Virginia, his daughters, uh, who are like my nieces, had a uh, had a uh, baseball tournament. So I went down there and watched that. And then at night, his father came over and his mom and his mom is like one of the best cooks ever. So she made freaking amazing food, and made like a cake from scratch. And, you know, she loves, she loves me because I love her cooking so much. And every time, every time it's like, Oh, it's the best cooking. So that's, that's what I did for father's day. I don't, did you do anything special or did you talk to your dad or anything like that? Of course I, I called my dad. I'm from Philadelphia originally, but now live in the Baltimore DC area. But I am going up to Philadelphia soon to kind of see my family for the first time since the start of the pandemic in person, get to hug him. So that's going to be great. But I certainly did talk to him. And, you know, obviously with my movie pick, it, it relates to my dad. And, you know, I'm glad that he's still around because he's had some some scares in the past. But but let's uh, get into the movies here. So with mine, I kind of ABC'd it a little bit. It, it's not a movie about dads or following a dad or anything. It just has a significant memory with me and my dad. And it was the first kind of R-rated movie that I got to watch with my dad. And he was kind of nervously looking at me the whole time because of the content. But we both really enjoyed the movie when we saw it, when it came out. And that's American Gangster starring Denzel Washington and Russell Crowe. So like I said, this was one of the, kind of the first R-rated movies that we shared. And he was kind of nervous about me watching it because obviously it's an R-rated movie. It's adult content, but we both really like the movie. It's directed by Ridley Scott and a nice true crime drama movie that I think was done really well that I just watched again the other day because it was on TV. But this was a movie I still like to this day. Yeah, American Gangster is a pretty phenomenal flick. Denzel Washington and Russell Crowe and, and, and uh, 
that's a pretty intense R-rated movie to for you to see as your first movie. I mean, like that's not like a Terminator or anything where it's just like R-rated action. That's a pretty intense R-rated movie, man. Yeah, so I'm glad my dad let me watch it because the opening scene of the movie is them lighting a guy on fire, Denzel and his boss at the time, his crime boss, buddy, friend, mentor, whatever, lighting a guy on fire and then shooting him and then the title card comes up. So yeah, that was definitely kind of a dad side eye moment while that was going on. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. I mean... Uh, to, to to borrow that the first r-rated i don't remember the first r-rated movie i saw with my father but i do remember like going to the theater once and, and my dad went and saw demolition man and i went and saw i believe last action hero because you know demolition man was you know r-rated movie and last action Hero was pg-13 <laughs> so i kind of remember that i'm almost positive it was last action hero but i remember that like split up and then we met back in the lobby after the movie but him and i saw a million movies in theaters together that was like our big thing and, and, and i even bought um, a couple movie posters recently of the last couple movies i saw with him in theaters and i uh, framed them and i put the ticket stubs because i keep my ticket stubs and so did my father and i taped the ticket stubs to the poster and i framed them so they look pretty cool because it's got our ticket stubs for the last couple movies we went and saw so uh, you know but american gangster that's a how old were you when this was i mean how so I believe American Gangster came out around the year 2007, give or take. So that would have made me about 15 at the time. So not not super out of, you know, I, I hadn't really seen that many R-rated movies yet because you're still a teenager. The parents are always debating about what R movies you should see if you do. So not really super young, but still, you know, a little bit under that 17 rating. So with my pick, I didn't ABC it as much as I just ate it. Uh, we did a story about Father's Day, so my pick is the movie called Father's Day with uh, Billy Crystal and Robin Williams. Yeah, so I guess you have never even heard of that one. It's uh, it's the first movie they ever did. I think it's the only movie they ever did together. Um, it's 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 not the best comedy movie. It's also not the worst. You got Billy Crystal and Robin Williams. It's going to be decent enough, but it's basically just about um, two guys – who don't know if they're the father of this grown up kid who's like in kind of in a little bit of trouble or he like ran away or something like that. And so they team up to kind of go find him and they're not really sure which one is the actual father of this kid. And you know, it's, it's a, it's a Sunday afternoon movie as we like to call some of these movies. Sure. So if you put those two together on screen, even if the writing is terrible, if the story is terrible, that you're probably still going to be entertained at least on some level. So I'll admit, when you first said Father's Day, I kind of pictured in my head because I had never heard of this movie before. When you said Father's Day, I thought it was another one of these holiday ensemble cast movies in the same vein as He's Not That Into You and Valentine's Day and New Year's and all these different ones that have come out. But I'm, I thought, did I miss one that was called Father's Day that, that flew under the radar with another kind of ensemble cast that was an OK rom-com? Well, you wouldn't. Yeah, they did Mother's Day as well. That was Gary Marshall's last movie ever. Was Mother's Day? No, this one came out I think 1997, I believe. And, and like I said, it's not one that you're going to seek out unless you're like on a, a Robin Williams or Billy Crystal binge because you're going to throw it in there if you're on a binge of their their stuff. But I mean, in the rank of each of their movies or each of their career, it, it falls dead dead middle. Not not the greatest. Definitely not the worst dead middle solid sunday afternoon movie all right so next up is uh on monday or actually the day that you're probably listening to this um mel brooks will be celebrating his 95th birthday which is amazing and uh for me mel brooks is on my route rushmore he is one of my idols don rickles mel brooks robin williams and above all else chris farley those have been my four idols in my life because I just consider them the legends of comedy. And I have heroes as well. Trey Parker, Matt Stone, I would put in that. But those are my Mount Rushmore guys. And I just, dude, 95 years old. I hope he still is kicking around for another, you know, I hope he goes the Kirk Douglas route and lasts until he's like 101 or whatever. So are you a Mel Brooks fan? Is that your style of comedy? Personally, I think he's a little overrated, but no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So God, God bless him that he's still up there at that age, still around, that obviously he's given us a lot of classic comedies 
and you'll see we may have had the same ones, obviously the same movie picks, because obviously there are his more well-known ones that he's done that have gotten widespread critical and audience acclaim that, you know, he's just what it's like you said up top. He's just a classic comedy guy that you've seen some of his stuff, whether you know it or not, if you know who Mel Brooks is, hopefully you do, because he's a pretty big figure of the last however many years he's been making movies, TV shows and such. So I definitely am a Mel Brooks fan. Yeah, that'd be a good test, man, to like talk to a 20 year old or a 15 year old now and ask them, do you know who Mel Brooks is and see if see if we've failed as a society in, in making sure this man's legacy lives forever. Well, that's tough because at 15 or 20, I'm not sure if I would have known exactly who Mel Brooks is. I think I saw Young Frankenstein when I was a teenager-ish. I can't remember exactly, but I wouldn't say that's a super fair test because your tastes get better as time goes on. I will admit, I didn't have the best taste in movies when I was 15. I was kind of starting to head in a good movie taste direction, but... You know, I still like the the Transformers franchise when I was 15. I still like the Transformer franchise now, dude. They're freaking awesome. It's a freaking... All right, well, that's another story for another day. But well, let's start on our movie picks. I'll get going. We'll see if we pick the same one. I just went with the first Mel Brooks movie I ever saw, which was Spaceballs. So, all right, there you go. So I picked Spaceballs as well. To me, this is probably my favorite. It's close because, again, there are a lot of classic Mel Brooks comedies, but Spaceballs, maybe it's because of the Star Wars theme spoof it has going, or maybe it's just his most famous or the one that everybody is able to quote more easily or that it's just the most entertaining. But for me, Spaceballs is probably my favorite Mel Brooks comedy. Yeah, and I have to agree with that, dude. I've... I've seen Spaceballs more times than I can count on my hands and toes. It's 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 a damn near perfect comedy. It's a pretty when it comes to parody, man, this is parody. Not like the garbage they've been churning out over the last fifteen years or whatever, where it was it just where they were making fun of the trailer of a movie and it just parody has become a parody of itself. But when you talk about Mel Brooks and Spaceballs, that's true parody. That is taking an IP like Star Wars and making fun of it in a super original way. I mean, and point point nothing closer to that was a horrible phrase, but just the best scene in that movie, the best parody scene is the yogurt scene with Yo where he's Yoda and he's talking about merchandise and merchandise. That is a perfect piece of parody comedy, I think. Yeah, Scary Movie 6 or the many other movies like it that have come out over the last however many years, they are no space balls. You know, whether they got it right with the first Scary Movie or the first of some of these other spoofs that have come in recent years, that, that remains up for debate. But Space Balls, I think, is one of these original parody movies that gets it absolutely right. 100%. And I, yeah, I, I, the first two scary movies the ones that were done by keenan ivory waynes are funny movies but that made way to the stites or fright friedberg versions of parody movies that were just horrible i think i saw one or two of them in theaters and i just wanted to punch myself in the face after i left well you're a braver man than me because i would not have given any of my money to some of these later spoof movies that came along that look just so lazy and so dated you know looking back at them now you probably wouldn't be able to even get half the references that they make that's a good point yeah they they, they probably have not aged very well and and they're just not good and mel brooks is a man and, and mel brooks always talked about making a, a, a sequel to Spaceballs to parody the new star wars movies but at 95 i don't think that's gonna happen no, I, I'm always of the mind where, hey, don't try to fix something that isn't broken. Don't try to stack on top of this standalone classic space balls. Just leave it as is. 100% and RIP John Candy and Joan Rivers. A big television premiere, not necessarily something we cover usually, but it's kind of a big news story because it's one of the more popular shows out there. But a new season of Rick and Morty, season five, just premiered this past week. I tuned in the, into the premiere. I absolutely loved it because I am a Rick and Morty fan. As, and if you can't tell by your shirt, I'm assuming you are as well. So 
that answers that question that I had. But this article is just kind of a, an excuse to talk about the premiere and talk about the show a little bit before we kind of get into our movie picks relating to it. So what do you think of Rick and Morty? Where does it rank up there with some of your favorite TV shows these days? So yeah, Rick and Morty, I didn't start watching from the get go. I only got into it after season two, I think. And I just, I bought the Blu-rays and just kind of binge, binged them. Uh, and I, I thought it was hilarious, dude. It's such a, it's such a hilarious show. It's such a, well-written show it's such a it's a great show for old people and young people because it's funny but then they throw in those little those little references from like when i was a kid i'm like yeah that's funny yeah they do those things i'm like that's i like those and so hey i absolutely love rick and morty as you can tell my sweet merchandising shirt so i'm proud to say that i started watching somewhere around the middle of the first season so i've been a fan for a while and i just kind of watched this show when it was still airing its first season i just kind of caught episodes late at night and i thought hey this is actually pretty funny i remember the commercials you know because adult swim they had all these different animated shows that they were trying to get off the ground trying to get people to watch and i saw this one watched a couple episodes i thought this is pretty funny let me keep tuning in been watching ever since so I think you're right. I think it works on so many different levels. It's certainly different with its premise, with its tongue-in-cheek humor, with its mile-a-minute pop culture references and existentialism. And it just it's, it works on a lot of different levels. And I can't wait to see where it keeps going from here. 100%. Yeah. And the, the story was all about the merchandising of Rick and Morty, which is why I wore my shirt to show that I am a consumer of their merchandise. Uh, you know, they have a Wendy's tie-in, which they, they do the clever commercials with Wendy's where you're like, you, when I, I watch it on my DVR, so I, I zip through it, and then, like, I stop, and I'm like, wait, is this part of the show? And I'm like, oh, no, there's a there's a Frosty Chino outside the window. This is a commercial. And I'm like, ah, that's a clever, a clever way they did that, man. I like that. Yeah, it's like if you remember the Pringles commercials involving Rick and Morty from not too long ago. It's It's funny. It's a commercial, but they still try and make it still humorous and tied into the show so before we get to the movies here because my movie pick has to do with this little fun fact the creator of the show justin roiland when he initially came up with the concept years back he made an a little animated short badly drawn crudely animated short that basically kind of asked the question what if doc brown had propositioned marty mcfly while they were going together on their adventures and that's how the concept for Rick and Morty was born. And you can clearly see that the mad scientist and the teenager teaming up to go on adventures through space time. And that little short got, got popular and he made a few more short little episodes and eventually that morphed into the show. So obviously if you couldn't see where I was going with that, I picked the movie Back to the Future because one, it's a classic and two, because it obviously ties into the premise of the show. Well, I did the Mitch, we picked the same movie, thumbs up thing. Because I also knew that story about Back to the Future and stuff, so I went Back to the Future. So I actually didn't know that fun fact until a little bit ago, but of course, like I said, in hindsight, it makes complete sense. It's the same dynamic, it's that same kind of setup, gen general setup for the grandfather, the elderly kind of role model figure, although in Rick's case, not a great role model, but... And then the teenager that kind of gets dragged along on these crazy adventures. So enough about the show, because we could talk about it for a while, I'm sure. But Back to the Future, another one you could talk about for a while. Everybody knows it. So we'll keep it brief. But, you know, what do you want to say this time that's different than other all the other times you've talked about it before? Uh, just that it's probably the best trilogy ever made, I would say. And uh I did just buy a Doc Brown action figure last week because uh, there was an exclusive to Target and I didn't know it had come out yet. And so I went to Target and they weren't out on the floor. And I asked, the, I had to go up to the guy and I was with my friend, uh, my friend, and she pulled out her phone and she was like, "Do you have this?" The guy was like, "He's like giving the side eye, almost like he was hiding them in the back." And she was like, uh, "Your store says you have them in stock." And the guy kind of was like. Yeah, I have them in the back. How many you want? I think he was trying to hide them from me. But I got my Doc Brown action figure. It's hanging on my wall. Well, that's a great story about how you got your action figure from Target. So 
uh, getting back to the movie here, <laughs> you know, I, I, I agree with you that this is probably one of the better trilogies out there. I don't think it's perfect throughout. Of course, people have a little bit of criticism for two and definitely three, some, you know, jabs in there, but that doesn't mean they're far from perfect. They're still really good on their own or as the trilogy. But I think when people think the 80s, I think this is probably one of the movies or movie franchises that comes to mind most often. When you just think about an 80s movie or a famous movie or franchise from the 80s, I think this is the thing that people think of. Yeah, dude. I think Back to the Future, the first one, I, I love the second one too. The third one, I will say, is is not the best of the trilogy, but I still absolutely love it. But it's... um. Yeah, I think it's a perfect, the first one is damn near a perfect movie. And I remember October 15th, 2015, uh, I went to the theaters and I saw they had, they did a triple feature of all three movies that started at the exact time that Marty went to the future in 2015. So it started then. And I was thinking it wouldn't be packed. It, that was a sold out theater. And it was, it was awesome. It was awesome seeing all three of those movies on the big screen again. All right, so my last story today was just uh, Amazon Prime Day just happened, and uh, the story wasn't really that great. I just wanted to ask if you perused Amazon, if you bought anything, did you, did you, did you, did you go down the rabbit hole of looking to see what was on sale or anything? I guess I'm a little bit weird in the sense that whenever Cyber Monday rolls around or Prime Day or whatever it is, where a lot of stuff on Amazon is on sale. I never really get anything because I always look at it as, do I really need something right now? You know, it's great if I see a 50% off pair of headphones that, sure, I would like to have, but I don't really spend money unnecessarily like that. Every once in a while, I'll treat myself to a little something entertainment-wise, whether it's a movie or an item or a Blu-ray or something, something kind of along that line. But I don't really look at deals and say, that's too good to to pass up. I know that there's going to be another sale, another deal, something where that thing that I kind of want, but don't really need right now that I can grab it again on sale at some point. Right on. I, uh, as you can tell, I have, do not have that philosophy. I spend money on damn near everything. I've wasted my life on this crap. Um, but, uh, um, I, you know, normally Prime Day uh, the last couple of years has been garbage. And for whatever reason, this year, they actually had some decent like movie deals. So I, uh, I did spend a little money on some, on some new Blu-rays that I absolutely did not need, but will enjoy. Can you name some of those before we get into our movies here? I bought, so I bought the Mr. Robot, the complete series on Blu-ray because it's down to 30 bucks which I own the first three seasons already on Blu-ray, but season four was always around 28 bucks. So I was just like, well, if the whole series is just twenty nine ninety nine, I might as well just buy that. So I bought that, and then now I can trade in those other three and to, to get five bucks for them from a, you know, the DVD shop down the street. I bought the Tom Hanks News of the World. Um, I, bought, uh, I bought some car air fresheners that, that smell really good. Uh... Uh, a couple Anna Kendrick movies I didn't already on, you know, the essentials. Of course. So this was probably one that was a little bit hard to tie into a movie if you could maybe see one where Amazon pops up or something. So that's kind of what I did. Just briefly, Amazon was kind of in there. The main protagonist worked there a little bit. So I went with the movie Nomadland. Did we pick, this has to be a record, did we pick, is that the same movie again? Three this episode? That is the same movie. So I think that might be an, a new kind of career high for us. For Man. On the show, we picked three same movies relating to stories. So obviously the main protagonist, she works kind of at Amazon seasonally in one of their warehouses. They show her at at the beginning of the movie before she kind of hits the road in her van. And we really get into the rest of the story here. So... That was just the first one that kind of popped into my mind because obviously it's a recent movie. It's a really good movie. Obviously, the director, Chloe Zhao, is directing Marvel's Eternals movie coming out. So it's still relevant for a lot of reasons. Yeah. And I mean, it just won Best Picture. So we have discussed this a little bit already. But I just remember, yeah, the Amazon part of it was like, I didn't really understand that part of it when I first saw it. 
And then I just kind of realized, oh, I guess Amazon just hires these workers for short spurts to kind of cover the busy seasons. And it was always inter- it was interesting seeing how they uh, it, it seemed like that's really how an Amazon workshop works. I don't know if they were able to actually film in an Amazon spot, if that was a real warehouse that they filmed in. But it's just inter- I always wonder when I open my package, and I see the thing in there and then the bubble mailers. And I'm like, oh, I wonder how they and it's just it was interesting to see. And it's a. Uh, and the aspect of the movie actually was a reason it got a, kind of a lot of crap. Uh, there were people on the internet, because you know the internet is full of good people, who were uh, giving the movie crap because they were glorifying Amazon as a company or some stupid stuff like that. And I was like, okay. I, I think if you were paying attention, I don't really think they were glorifying Amazon. If anything, if you kind of paid attention, they were kind of saying how Amazon in a little bit like the premise of the movie, Nomad Land, these nomads that they kind of pick people up for a season and then just kind of cast them aside while kind of claiming to be with them. And that, that company mentality that you hear these days where companies stand by their employees and help them out. And if anything, to me, it kind of came off as a little bit of the opposite in the movie. Right on. I actually, yeah, I guess I, I just saw, I saw a kind of opposite where I was like, oh, I guess it's good for people like these nomads to kind of be able to pop into a new town and grab that nine to five while they're there. But I can see your your viewpoint of it where it is they, they hire these people and they cast them aside. So, you know, different, different takes on it or whatever. You know, as a company, Amazon, you know, I'm not too sure about their practices and all that, but I'd be lying if I said I'm not a Prime member. I've been a Prime member for like five years. I enjoy my two-day shipping, so I'm not going to get rid of it. Amazon is our future. So getting back to Nomadland here as a movie, we've talked about a little bit before when we did our Oscars episode earlier in the year, but what did you kind of think of it? Just to sum it up again, because when I first saw it, I really liked it. I thought it was one of these really artsy, really soulful, really deep human emotion movies that maybe isn't everybody's cup of tea, especially this year. People said that a lot of the nominees were just really depressing or really hard to watch consecutively, but I really liked Nomadland when I saw it. Yeah, this was a movie going in that with Francis McDormand, I was like, I'm probably going to like it because I love Francis McDormand, but also the concept of the movie and the fact that I had not seen any of Chloe Zhao's previous films had me going, this might be a boring ass movie. And then when I finished it, I was like, no, that was a phenomenal movie. I absolutely loved it. I I do think she deserved the best director because I think anybody can take a topic like that that could potentially be insanely boring and turn it into something as entertaining as Nomadland was, deserves that Oscar. Not only that, but she was directing, except for the few people who were actually actors in the movie, she was directing a lot of people in there who were playing the the Nomads were real life nomads not that many people might know that that outside of a few actors few familiar faces that you might pick up on a lot of the people were actual nomads kind of playing versions of themselves so the fact that she got that by me and i didn't know the difference at all that she was directing that as well she was directing them that i give her props for that too 100 percent Last but not least, in terms of our stories from the past week, there's a big sports story going around that the first openly gay NFL player just came out, did a little video on Instagram, and his name is Carl, and if I'm saying his last name right, Nassib, Nassib, however you pronounce it, sorry for butchering it, but he is a member of the Las Vegas Raiders, and he is the first active NFL player to come out as gay because There was a story a few years back with a player named Michael Sam who was drafted and was on a practice squad for, I believe it was the Cowboys and the Rams at the time, but never quite made it into the league as a starter, as a player. So this is the first one, and in my opinion, very much needed, and this couldn't have come at a better time during Pride Month. So I'm sure this is great to finally have some representation for people who are gay and who watch football. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I always, I always, these coming out stories, I always wonder. I get, I get that they're big because it helps people see that maybe if they're young and they're not sure what to do, it helps seeing a big person come out and all that stuff. 
But I always wonder if it's if it's detrimental to make such a big deal out of a gay person coming out of the closet. Because to me, it's like, does that take away the normality of it? Well, on the flip side, I'll argue that unfortunately, it's a thing that people have to come out because we make it a big deal and we make it and we're not always accepting of, you know, that decision by them to say that they're that sexual orientation. So I will say that unfortunately, it's a thing because we've kind of made it a thing. But I will say as a segue to what you're saying in terms of the people who are unsure, the youths and people who are younger who are in the spectrum that really aren't sure of themselves or what their future might look like. When he came out in his video, he said that he's going to personally donate and it was matched by the NFL as well, which is a good move by then, but $100,000 each to the Trevor Project. And for people who may not know, that's a charitable organization that provides means and services for basically at risk kind of, you know, LGBTQ youths who are on suicide prevention watch or just again kind of unsure of themselves or their place in their future or their world so i think that's a great organization because suicide prevention is a big issue for me personally with supporting that and helping people who need it but getting back to the story here you know this is obviously met with some support but maybe not maybe not quite as much support as i was expecting just an outpouring of different players from around the league saying good for this guy. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that. I saw the people coming out and saying, good job, good job and stuff. And I, and you see other players talking about when I played, there were five or six guys in my locker room who were gay, but they were just scared to come out. So I guess that kind of leads to the, to the contradiction of what I said earlier, where I guess it is important to make a big story out of this because it isn't normal for people to come out. And so I guess if the first guy to do it will be, will lead to other people doing it, which will then lead to the normality of whoever wants to play football can play football without the fear of uh, maybe locker room segregation. Absolutely. So obviously this was a little bit tough to kind of pair with a movie because there's not really a movie about this yet, at least that I could find where you, you, you kind of say maybe there is, but at least I couldn't find about an, a gay football player. So instead, what I tied to it was the Las Vegas aspect of the Raiders and kind of made a little bit of a double entendre out of the title of the movie. But I picked the movie Swingers starring Vince Vaughn. And John Favreau from back in the day, I think it was a late 90s, maybe whenever it was in the 90s movie. And Swingers, I think, is a nice, enjoyable, I don't know what to call it. I'm not sure if I would call it a comedy or a drama, but it's an enjoyable, almost kind of a human interest movie. Yeah, I absolutely love Swingers. It's a phenomenal script. I think John Favreau had written the script. It was directed by Doug Lyman. I think that was like his first big movie as well before he went on to do, you know, the Bourne movie and, and Edge of Tomorrow and all these bigger movies and stuff. And yeah, dude, I mean, that movie is so great. I mean, it's where everybody gets the phrase, you're so money, you don't know how money you are and stuff like that. It's it's just, it's a dude movie, really, because it's just about dudes going and, and having some debaucherous fun. Yeah, so I will instantly become best friends with someone if I say the reference around somebody, you're so money, and they instantly understand that reference. So Swingers is an enjoyable movie. It's a little bit of a short watch, but again, it's just kind of a a quiet, I almost think of like a human interest movie. So I'm really curious now, I guess maybe I missed it. Is there a movie out there kind of like this real life story? So we actually already touched upon my movie pick a little bit. You touched upon it. And the movie I picked is Valentine's Day. Because if you remember in Valentine's Day, there's a whole story about a football player who's not sure if he's going to retire, if he's not going to retire. And then at the end of the movie, you find out, not towards the end, but you know, toward, towards the end of the movie, he has a press conference where everybody thinks he's going to announce his retirement. And nope, he announces that he's gay. So I'll be honest, I've seen bits and pieces of Valentine's Day, but this isn't one of these kind of similar movies that I've seen in the same vein as He's Just Not That Into You and New Year's Eve and all these other ones that are kind of, for me, just kind of blend together. So I've seen bits and pieces, but I guess I didn't really put two and two together because I've never seen the entire movie. Yeah, no, it's just like, the, yeah, the whole movie is, you know, there's it's one of those 
amalgamation movies where it's uh, several different stories playing. And one of them is this football player played by Eric Dane, who is, you know, not sure if he's going to retire or not. And his agent's played by, I think, Jessica Biel is his agent or his manager or something. And so it's just this whole thing. You think he's like a ladies' man the whole time. And then at the end, you know, he does this big press conference. Everybody's there, all the reporters, everybody. They all think he's announcing his retirement. And he's just like, nope, I'm gay. And everybody's like, so you're not retiring, right? And he's like, no, I'm not retiring. I'm going to play as long as I want. And it's, uh, I enjoy Valentine's Day. I, I, I didn't like that movie. Yeah, I might have to go back and watch it now for this scene, kind of predicting the future, I guess, at the time. But yeah, I'm sure it's perfectly enjoyable. Again, like I said, it kind of blends together with these other similar movies. So I'm sure it's perfectly enjoyable. Like you said a little bit earlier, it's probably a Sunday afternoon movie that you just kind of tune into, have have on in the background, just something warm and familiar to watch on a Sunday afternoon while you're just hanging out at home. So I'm sure it's a perfectly acceptable movie. It's it's not bad. And I mean, I'd be lying if I said I haven't watched it on Valentine's Day when I had nothing to do because I'm a massive tool. I was just going to say, as you like calling yourself all the time when you have a calendar movie come up that you always watch on a certain day, you just like calling yourself a tool. And I'll be honest, I have a couple of those. I always watch the original 1978 Halloween on Halloween. I always watch Mean Girls on the unofficial Mean Girls Day on October 3rd. But I'm not quite as intense as you with all these different holidays and a lot of specific days that you watch movies on. All right. So our movie of the week this week is one is a movie I very much enjoy. And you're probably wondering, how do we pick our movies of the week? And for me, it involved going like this. Oh, OK. So that's what happened was I looked to my right, saw it on my shelf, texted Mitch and said, have you seen this? He said, yep. I said, that's our movie of the week. And that movie is Phone Booth. Um, I, I enjoy it. It's an outdated movie because it's about a phone booth. And, you know, I don't know if there are any phone booths out there anymore, anywhere. Maybe the airport still has like those little phone banks or whatever, but. So, yeah, in terms of existing phone booths, I'm really not sure if there are any more, at least that I remember seeing any time recently. But you're right. Maybe at airports, they still have phone banks, but I'm not entirely sure. But getting back to the movie here, I will. First of all, I'll say my my impression of it up top, which I think I think it's decent. I think it's OK. Again, it's kind of middle of the road. It's not the worst. It's not the best. But I will at least give it props for doing something a little bit different i mean almost the entire movie takes place in a phone booth how do you really keep audiences paying attention for that long well you make an interesting story about a guy's infidelity and involve the police and have a crazy shooter and it's just you know it it's a good movie i i i think i like it a little bit more than you judging from that tepid reaction which is it is one I can watch once every every year, maybe every other year, where I just I enjoy going back to it. I think, you know, you got Kiefer Sutherland and his voice is just perfect and, and I love the sound design of that one too, because his voice is so crisp and clear when it's just t- tunneling in through the phone booth or whatever. And and it's an early Colin Farrell movie. So it's it, this was before Colin Farrell was, you know, big time Colin Farrell. This is one of the movies that I think got him there. And uh I, I think as a thriller it plays pretty phenomenally as just like the the guy's in a phone booth. He's got a sniper rifle on him. And this guy is like forcing him to tell the world about, you know, what type of person he is. I think that's fair. I will say that I'm not really sure. Maybe a lot of people would agree with you in terms of rewatchability for this movie, because to me, it's one of these stories that you see it once you're, you're curious how it unfolds, but there wasn't really a lot of rewatchability there where you know how things happen, you know the little details that come out. So I'm not sure how much entertainment value there is going back and watching this movie multiple times. I think, you know, the story kind of unfolds from start to finish and then you just kind of say, I liked it or I didn't like it. And I just don't really see somebody rewatching this one over and over. So I, I do like Colin Farrell's acting. I think he was good in this, but I think of a movie like this to me, they're not really super similar, but I kind of think of speed when I think of this movie where, you know, the quality is, I think, pretty similar. And it's a story about a story unfolding all these little twists and turns with a simple premise with 
a madman behind a phone kind of talking to the hero and lives are on the line. And, you know, I think Speed has a lot more rewatchability than this one where, again, like the story unfolds, the whole thing takes place in a phone booth. It's not horrible, but at least with Speed, you can go back and there's still a lot of side action and things going on that catch your eye that are still entertaining to watch a second time. Yeah, I, I mean, I will say I do like Speed better, 100%. But this one, I think, you know, it's a Joel Schumacher movie. I'm a big Joel Schumacher fan, um, which actually the other movie, I didn't even put this together. The other movie I asked you if you had seen, which is Falling Down, uh, is also a Joel Schumacher movie. And the, uh, apropos of nothing, watch Falling Down, one of the best performances ever by Michael Douglas. But let's get back to Phone Booth. Uh, phone Booth, it's just... It's it's a short movie too. It's only like eighty some minutes, so it's not a it's not a not a heavy watch. And it was written by the same guy who wrote Cellular. I don't know if you ever saw that with uh, Chris Evans. And so that guy was on a big uh, phone kick, I guess, when he wrote these movies. But um, for me, it's it's a really good. I, I appreciate I appreciate never seeing the bad guy until kind of the end. I appreciate. The, the story you have Forrest Whitaker is in it who's just I mean a le- one of the greatest actors to ever live you got Katie Holmes Rada Mitch- Mitchell is in it so it's got like this stellar cast and it's just uh I, I just very much enjoy the movie that's fair and I do give this movie again props for doing this where you just said they kind of have a little bit of restraint with the antagonist with the villain with the bad guy where they kind of give you a, give you the bad guy in little bits and pieces instead of a lot of movies these days kind of feel like we've talked about a little bit before instant gratification where you want to see the bad guy doing bad guy things as soon as possible and you don't really get to know them that well and i think when you use this kind of restraint that phone booth had you have to pay attention more to their words that they hit harder that you're listening a little bit closer because you're not really seeing the person talking. You're not really seeing what they're doing. Or you don't really know exactly what their motives are yet. So it makes you pay attention to their character a little bit more, which I will say the movie did well. Yeah, dude. And I yeah, I think to kind of wrap this one up is just, just bringing it back. I think this was an early 2000s movie, so I, I doubt it's a movie that's withstood the test of time in terms of Again, talking about a 15, 20, maybe even a 25-year-old now may not have ever seen this movie, to be honest. And so I think it's a kind of a good movie to bring up just to be like, go watch this movie. It's a, it's a good movie, a good thriller. You know, it's not it's not people running around on their cell. Because if this movie was filmed today, it'd be over in five minutes. The dude would just get on his cell phone and be like, oh, okay. But like it was, a, it was a it was a movie of its time that I still enjoy probably because I saw it in theaters when it came out. It might be like a movie like if you see it today, they're gonna be like, "This is dumb." A phone booth? Ew! What is that? But for me, I saw it in theaters when it came out, and because of that, it's just been on my on my queue every couple of years. All right, so that's going to do it for week 24 of Life Imitating Movies. Uh, for the first time, I think we picked, was it, three similar movies, and and some of them weren't even, like, obvious picks, but we went there. We we had those similar picks, so pretty good. And I think we picked a couple older movies for people to probably go check out, like an American Gangster or a phone booth. So anything you want to wrap up with there, Mitch? No, I will say I'll have to check with our statistician on staff to see if they got if we got that right, if that's the most that we've had three of the same movies in one episode. But yeah, hopefully we've touched on some different movies, different eras, different genres that we, we keep it diverse here. We have a variety of different things that we talk about. So I think we definitely accomplished that this week. 100 percent. And I think we, we should talk about a raise for our statistician because that is not an easy job. But uh We'll be back next week. Same bad time, same bad place, probably. Um, I think next week we're going to do a new movie of the week. I think we're doing Fast 9, possibly. I mean, we're going to talk about the Fast series as a whole, but Fast 9. Yeah, we are, and it's it's going to be an interesting discussion because we are of two very different minds on this franchise. Oh, yes, we are. So we'll see you all next week. Take it easy. <laughs>